what I told you when I sent feedback to you if I said good job you know if there was just a couple of things um, send back to finalize one once you make those or just say hey you know I made those those few last changes you know just so that I have you know yeah yep yep thank you <laughs> Yeah. 
Okay, so I have decided that we should start with donuts because then that way I'm hopeful you'll have a sugar high for like a majority of the lecture. Um, so we'll just, we'll just hope that'll be the case. Um, we need to be thinking about uh, the ripping and stripping of high energy electrons off of these donuts as we are pondering aerobic respiration today. So that will be the primary means by which everyone is generating energy during our lecture. Because, of course, you are aerobic right now. You're not working out really hard. Oh, you get the kind of long Johnny looking ones there. <laughs> I, was, I was laughing really hard because I called Safeway uh, literally like more than 24 hours ago. And they're like, I'm sorry, ma'am, we can't make that many donuts in 24 hours. I was like, really? So fortunately, Ridley's was like, okay, we can make you donuts in 24 hours. And you have to know that how much I love you, because I'm, I'm not eating sugar. So I don't even get one of these puppies today. <laughs> A variety of reasons. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the deal of the donuts is that um, you need to munch quietly here so I can say a few words. So we have a few up and coming events. This morning I did post the review for the exam. So that is coming less than a week from now. So be thinking about getting ready for that. And remember that one of the best ways to get ready is to focus on your poster and really be thinking about your poster. So yesterday, Lily came to me and she showed me a picture of her poster and she kind of wanted to know, you know, am I, is it looking good? Am I doing the right things? And there is no right or wrong on that, except for that I don't want really large blocks of text on it. So if you have like a disembodied fact inside of yourself, that's probably not a thing, right? If just floating somewhere in your cell, it says something like a correlation is the, you know, blah, 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 blah. That disembodied fact inside the cell is not what I want. I want it to be what is actually happening in the cell. So you might draw oxidative phosphorylation and label it, and then that's totally solid, okay? So make sure that it's limited to labels. Make sure that it's of your own making. I want it to be on a single sheet, not because I'm trying. So it's not the same as what maybe you've had in other classes where perhaps, oh, you brought your son on the right day, Mendy. Oh, don't. <laughs> so it's perfect. <laughs> so the reason for the one sheet rule is not because I'm trying to limit how much you put on your poster. Remember, your poster can be a sharp, it can be absolutely huge. What, the reason for the one sheet rule is that I want you to begin to appreciate, um, and hopefully come to, come to appreciate very much, the interconnectedness of everything. So I want you to see how one thing relates to another, which relates to another. And by being all on one sheet, I'm hoping that that will facilitate that. So that you see the connection between glycolysis and the TCA cycle. And then that you likewise see the connection between that and maybe transporters that we talked about earlier on an earlier set of coverage. And you're able to connect them. And that's what I want you to look for is connections. That's going to be what it's all about. Okay, cool. So now that you are ripping and stripping high energy electrons, we're pretty ready to jump in. Um, I think I did want to address the hypothesis thing. Many of you have finished your hypotheses, so you're ready to just kind of go on to the next stage. Um, one thing that, um, that I did have a question on this morning is if I made tiny little suggestions on your most recent iteration of your hypothesis, do send me the finalized one. Even if it was like we just decided we should change one term or something like that, send it back to me in its final form so that I just have that recorded. 
I know what's going on in your world. Uh, so that would be great. Um, if I sent something to that said, wow, this looks fantastic, it meets all of the rubric criteria, you're rocking my world, then you're done. You don't need to send me anything more. Okay, wonderful. Get those um, skill assessments done. If you're in a bind on one of those, for example, you're gone for a track event later this week, we'll work it out. But otherwise, try to get them to me on Friday. Try to turn them in. You can turn them in at the very end of Open Lab if you want to. So there is still a window of time there uh, to get through them. Any thoughts or questions on this? Okay, cool. So tell me this. As you've ripped and stripped high energy electrons off of your donuts and you have um, brought them into your body primarily in the form of pretty simple sugar, right? That's, those are pretty simple sugar. What is the first thing that happens to that glucose? Oh, good. It gets phosphorylated. Excellent. So well, that's a specific way to say that the first step of what pathway happens to it glycolysis. You got it. So this will then, this glucose will pass, pass through the glycolytic pathway. And who can tell me what is the net yield of glycolysis, both with respect to ATPs and NADHs? Two, right? It's so great with glycolysis because everything is two, two, two. Two NADH, two ATP, two pyruvates. Now, what is a possible fate of pyruvate? Once you've made those two pyruvate molecules, what might happen to them? Okay, good. So say that you had your 12 donuts. Now, my skiers have tried this before. It does not work very well. You've downed all your 12 donuts, and then you're like, oh, coach, hill bounding. I'm so excited. So hill bounding is incredibly anaerobic. That means they're going to be generating high lactate levels. Um, don't try that, right? It's not going to be uh, conducive um, to good training. Um, but the lactate, right, that fate would be, what would we say the fate of pyruvate was if lactic acid was getting made? Fermentation? That actually is not the answer. So jot this down. The fate of pyruvate is to serve as an... Yes, an acceptor of electrons from NADH allowing for the regeneration of NAD plus so that glycolysis can keep on going. So the fate of pyruvate is not fermentation. The fate of pyruvate is to serve as an internal electron acceptor to keep glycolysis going. We call that process fermentation. Okay, does that make sense? It's a little different than just saying the fate of pyruvate is fermentation. Wonderful. Now, what would be a possible other fate of pyruvate? Further oxidation, right? Keep on ripping and stripping high energy electrons off of that pyruvate as it passes first into the transition step and then where we're going to start today at the top of the TCA cycle. So going through further oxidation, getting more electrons ripped and stripped off of it. And that's where I want to begin our coverage today is with that further oxidation fate. So let's take a look at the top of the TCA cycle and see our acetyl-CoA two-carbon molecule, yet worth lots of electrons, is going to enter into this cycle. So the... Acetyl-CoA molecule in step one of the TCA cycle is actually going to be added onto the last intermediate of the cycle called oxaloacetate. So we're going to see a very non-representative step in step number one. That is, most of the TCA cycle is about breakdown, right? But in order to get the two carbon moiety into the TCA, we've got to have one buildup step. Got to form bonds so that we can bring that two carbon acetyl CoA into the cycle and form the molecule citrate. So the very first step of the TCA cycle in which oxaloacetate, a four carbon molecule, reacts with the two carbon acetyl is going to be a building step. 
It is the only synthesis in the pathway. So it is an anomaly. And the acetyl group is transferred onto oxaloacetate to make citrate. Notice then that the large citrate molecule is formed. This is the molecule for which the pathway is named, right? The citric acid cycle, citrate, citric acid. So this step is a condensation. It is a building step. But everything from here on out is going to be all about ripping and stripping high energy electrons. It's going to be all about, what's another name for that kind of pathway? Catabolic, what else? <laughs> Oxidative, right, good. So we're breaking down, we're oxidizing. Overall, the TCA cycle is going to generate reducing power. And the second step is going to ready us for that. Now, it may not seem like a big deal. Citrate converted to isocitrate. This is just a rearrangement. But it actually is a really big deal. Because remember the middle name of the TCA cycle is reducing power, meaning that the whole goal is to oxidize the intermediates. And it turns out that citrate is a tertiary alcohol. It's not very easily oxidized. So the whole point of converting citrate to isocitrate is to make a secondary alcohol that is very easily oxidized. We've now created a molecule, isocitrate, that is easily oxidized. And in the next step, it's going to become oxidized. So what do we expect to pop out of that step? OK, said broadly, everybody. What do we call it when something gets oxidized and we generate high energy electrons? We produce reducing power, right? We expect reducing power to pop out of this step. So we're expecting NADH to be formed. And we know that the intermediate isocitrate has been oxidized. So we could say in a very sexy way that alpha ketoglutarate is more highly oxidized than is isocitrate. And we know that NAD plus will become reduced, forming NADH. Now, here is the wicked cool thing. Actually, there's two wicked cool things. One is that enzyme naming turns out it's super easy. Because every time you see an intermediate getting oxidized and forming reducing power, the name of the enzyme is always the same. It's always the name of the substrate plus dehydrogenase. So what's the name of the substrate? Isocitrate. And the next name on this enzyme? Dehydrogenase. So we can already label the name of the enzyme that catalyzes this. So isocitrate dehydrogenase is the name of the enzyme catalyzing step three. Now, this is going to be the rule on every single redox reaction in which the substrate is oxidized. Now, those of you who are like, wait a minute, is that the IUPAC name for this enzyme? I mean, is that really as technical as it gets? Uh, it turns out it can get a little more technical than that, where we can actually call it the name of the molecule that's oxidized, the name of the molecule that's reduced, plus oxidoreductase. So another name, for those of you who like it more technical for this enzyme, could be isocitrate NADH oxidoreductase. But most scientists call it isocitrate dehydrogenase. So now, notice what else happened there. Right, good. One, thoroughly worn out, totally used up, CO2 popped off. How many CO2s do we expect to come out of the cycle in total? Two, because two carbons went in, they're getting totally oxidized. We expect to see at least one more. Now, if you want to sound really great on your next date, 
you can say isocitrate dehydrogenase catalyzes the oxidative decarboxylation of isocitrate. And that's the way to get a second date, right? You don't think the mark. <laughs> oh, come on, you've tried it. Um, so <laughs> isocitrate is getting oxidized. It's also losing a CO2. So we call this an oxidative decarboxylation. But not to worry, just in case that one wasn't enough, there is another one. So alpha ketoglutarate is now going to get oxidative de oxidatively decarboxylated, and we know we're going to produce what? <laughs> CO2 plus NADH. You got it. We know those things are going to pop out when alpha ketoglutarate is oxidatively decarboxylated. Now, just a moment. What is the name of that superhero enzyme? Actually, we haven't really gotten to the super superhero enzyme yet. What is its name? Name of the substrate. Alpha ketoglutarate plus dehydrogenase. <laughs> so this is alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. So yet another oxidative decarboxylation catalyzed by alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. So we now have seen the loss of the last CO2. Isn't that interesting that by the time we hit step four, we've lost the two CO2s, two oxidative decarboxylations. But does anybody have this sneaking suspicion that they've seen this molecule before, succinyl-CoA? And be like, oh, somewhere in the back of head, I, I feel like I've seen succinyl-CoA. Look back at your table of phosphoryl group transfer potentials. It doesn't seem like a prime suspect at first, but look back at it and tell me how much energy is found in the thioester bond. Turns out that thioesters are really high in energy. How much energy is found in the thioester bond of succinyl CoA? 32, enough to make ATP? Yes, it is. So we are anticipating the first of what kind of phosphorylation? Substrate level, nice. So we're ready for the one, the only, substrate level phosphorylation in all of TCA. GDP is going to get phosphorylated to make GTP. Now, Corinne talked to us about this the other day when she said, wait, I thought that TCA produced GTP and not ATP, but what can that GTP quickly and easily do with its high energy phosphoryl group? Phosphorylate ADP making ATP. So that very quickly happens. And it really does depend upon the type of organism, whether it originally makes GTP or originally makes ATP. But CoA um, is, is removed and energy is harvested as GTP. So said another way, the really high energy thioester bond in this molecule is broken. And that forms ATP. Can anybody else, uh, can anybody tell me where else we saw this co-substrate? At the beginning, right up here. So actually, as it turns out, whenever a CoA is bound onto a molecule, there's a high energy bond. So in step one of the TCA, that high energy bond doesn't yield ATP, but it does power the addition of this two carbon unit onto this four carbon unit. So it's the energy in pent up in that thioester bond that actually powers that first step or step one. But here it's used to make ATP. So that's kind of cool. And get this, succinate is the very first molecule in all of the TCA that is completely, um, you can't tell apart the carbons because it looks the same. It's symmetric, right? It's symmetric, looks the same on both sides. So it's the point at which we actually lose track of the carbons. But succinate is also another molecule that, you guessed it, can become oxidized, right? So what do we expect to pop out of this step six? Reducing power. But guess what? It's not NADH. It's FADH2, right? Lily's happy to hear. FADH2, right? And what do we know is true about FADH2 that wasn't true of NADH? What can't FADH2 do? 
leave. It can't leave its enzyme. It's the in-house waiter or waitress that has to stay in uh, the restaurant while delivering food. So FADH2 has to stay in its enzyme. So it transfers its electrons into a mobile carrier called ubiquinone. So Q, ubiquinone, will take on those electrons, becoming QH2. And QH2 is a mover and a shaker. Q is actually a lipid-soluble molecule. It is incredibly um, soluble in the phospholipid tails of the phospholipid bilayer. And so it flits around in that hydrophobic, you know, swimming pool. And it just gets all over the place. And it delivers electrons to other members of the ETC. Now, here is where things get really exciting because I promised that you would meet a superhero, and this is the superhero. So what is the name of this enzyme? And I can hear ladies over here are already labeling it. What's it called? Name of the substrate, succinate plus dehydrogenase, and you just named Wonder Woman. Yeah, right? This enzyme is Wonder Woman. Now, I know some of you are a little too young to remember that. Maybe I'm hoping you have, like, an infatuation for old bad shows. Um, <laughs> so Diana Prince by day, Wonder Woman by night, right? And so this enzyme is not only enzyme 6 of the TCA, but it is complex 2 of the ETC. So it is literally a superhero playing a huge role in both pathways. You can also see how that links the ETC directly to the TCA cycle. You can also make sense of the fact that FADH2 doesn't have to move because it's simultaneously a part of the ETC and a part of the TCA. Yep. Yep. It's already part of, of the ETC. So it's kind of like it doesn't have to go anywhere to be simultaneously in both pathways. It's pretty cool. My favorite enzyme by far. So we've now made fumarate, and fumarate can become hydrated to form a molecule called malate. Malate can get yet once again oxidized. So when malate is oxidized, what do we expect to form? Reducing power, right? And this time it's going to take the form of NADH. And we know that the name of the enzyme is, I'll let you write, and somebody can shout out the name of the enzyme, malate dehydrogenase, yes. <laughs> so it turns out that in the end you were able to fill out the TCA cycle all by yourself. Because there's so much that reoccurs then, as long as we know the theme. Hey, how many in total NADHs per turn of the TCA? Three, right? Count them, step three, four, and eight. Three. Okay, good. How many FADH2s? One, okay? Now, what about this? How many times does the TCA cycle turn per glucose? Twice. Good, because there were two pyruvates, two acetyl-CoA's, and the TCA cycle will necessarily have to turn twice. Meaning, how many NADHs for, per glucose? Six. And two FADH2s per glucose. So I like to be able to think through those things, really understanding yield and output. The other thing we could say, per turn of the TCA, how many substrate-level phosphorylations happen? One, only one. Step five is our only step in which we see any yield of actual ATP gazentite. It's, it's those donuts. <laughs> it's just so exciting. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll tell you a joke sometime about that. Um, so how, when we look at that and we notice what goes in and what comes out, right, you see that CO2 comes out. But one of the things that we notice never goes in to the pathway is oxygen. So in actuality, the TCA cycle never requires oxygen. Why then does the TCA cycle immediately stop turning or very quickly stop turning in the absence of oxygen in an organism that respires aerobically? 
Okay, I like that thought. Maybe it's because oxygen is needed somewhere upstream. But remember that in the, um, in the glycolysis, it can function either aerobically or anaerobically. It doesn't need oxygen. And the transition step doesn't consume oxygen either. Good. Okay, good. So remember the middle name of TCA's reducing power right? It's making all kinds of reducing power. And if that reducing power has nowhere to go, it doesn't make any sense to make more of it. And in fact, there's no system for regenerating it. In glycolysis, fermentation exists, and we can regenerate, quickly regenerate some NAD plus there. But there isn't any way to do that for the TCA. So if there's no place for the reducing power to go, aka no functional electron, terminal electron acceptor, and no functional ETC, it doesn't make any sense to make a whole bunch more of it. Right? It's just silly. So that is the reason that TCA doesn't run. Now, this is also why a couple of you, Carrie and Martin and um, Candice and, and Nandy, are making some connections. That is, when you're in the fat burning zone, what does it mean to be in the fat burning zone? Like, you know, you're on the treadmill and you hit fat burning zone. <sighs> right? <sighs> What's going on when I'm running in the fat burning zone? I'm using, yeah, I'm using lipids, okay? And oh, does anybody remember, like, in your donuts, you just ripped and stripped these donuts down, right? And you're breaking lipids down two carbon moieties at a time. Where do those two carbon moieties come in to metabolism? Okay, I love that. And that's actually showing knowledge of another pathway. Beta oxidation is the pathway that breaks them into two carbon units. Okay, so I love that knowledge. Uh, beta oxidation will break them into two carbon units, and then those two carbon units go where? Top of the TCA. Okay? So why can I only burn fat when I am respiring aerobically? That is, I'm not sprinting. I'm just running at a nice OD pace, right? OD, over distance or LSD, long flow distance, right? When I'm running at those paces, I can use fat as a fuel because I have oxygen. I'm just breathing. I'm talking about, you know, last night's day. You know, we're just talking it up. We're not anaerobic, right? Once you're anaerobic, no more fat as fuel. You can't use it because your TCA has to be able to turn in order to bring in fat. And if it can't turn, you can't bring in fat because fat comes in as acetyl-CoA. The TCA, upon becoming anaerobic, stops turning. There's no place for the reducing power to go. But let's say that there is, and right now there is, because as you're oxidizing those donuts, you're sitting in your seats, which is kind of boring, but you are using aerobic respiration because you have plenty of oxygen, you're not working out anaerobically. So let's follow then the fate of the um, NADH and the FADH2. So we'll write our net yield, which we already did, and I just want to make sure everybody has this down. Per turn of the TCA, there's one ATP via substrate level phosphorylation. How many per glucose? The cycle turns? Twice, so two. One ATP per acetyl. So from each of those two carbon units that comes from a fat, cycle turns once. Per glucose, right, because you also had some of that in your donut, it wasn't all fat. So per glucose, cycle turns twice. Reducing power, how many NADHs? Three, or how many per glucose? Six. One FADH2, or? Two per glucose. But that's not the only thing that TCA makes. TCA also makes a ton of precursor metabolites, aka Legos, little building blocks for making other big stuff. For example, alpha ketoglutarate 
from the TCA cycle. You remember meeting that one. Alpha-ketoglutarate can get immediately utilized to make glutamate, the amino acid, the acidic one, the one that you still are remembering from your amino acid chart that you still have pinned up in front of your toilet or wherever. Um, so remembering that amino acid is built from alpha-ketoglutarate. So if we need a lot of glutamate, okay, so say Candace and Mandy did intervals this morning, you know, I don't know, you guys were probably in the weight room this morning. In the weight room, you know, and, and you need to repair damaged muscle tissue. Your TCA is probably fueling the synthesis of a lot of glutamate to repair your tissues. So what happens to the energy yield if the TCA cycle is fueling, a lot of molecules are spinning off, turning away from that TCA and headed into anabolic pathways. What does that do to the overall net yield of the TCA cycle? Qualitatively decreases it, right? True. Succinyl-CoA is another molecule. It can be used to make porphyrins. So porphyrins will, will meet those in, in uh, ETC. Oxaloacetate. Does anybody look at that and say, huh, this brings up bad homework memories. <laughs> Do you remember looking at oxaloacetate being on the biosynthetic precursor metabolite for that pathway that we had in the homework that led to the synthesis of amino acids like leucine and lysine and a variety of different amino acids? Remember that question? So oxaloacetate is a major precursor metabolite, a big Lego so it's cool to think about all the ways in which that cycle can be impacted if anabolism is the primary focus. But we need to do this question, and I'm going to have you pull in so you can work together. If 1.2 times 10 to 8 molecules of glucose are catabolized, how many ATP molecules are net via substrate level phosphorylation during both glycolysis and the TCA? Yes, so assuming that no molecules are diverted. This is a pretty easy one, but I want you to just uh, enter in your answers. Oh, just do something like, if you think the answer is 1.2 times 10 to the 44th, just text in 1.2 E44. That's easy. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Sweet. Are you are you hoping to like have like controlled sugar release over here? You know, little sugar at a time. Keep it going all lecture. <laughs> don't fall asleep. No, <laughs> another body don't. It's kind of like when I'm driving the ski team. <laughs> That part's like the, the not as, <laughs> as it, not as good part. <laughs> well, we have sort of like some agreement, like we're on the E18 order of magnitude, so that's cool. Hmm, all right, getting some agreement. Okay, cool. So why 4.8 and not 2.4? Two from each, right? How many from glycolysis in total? Two. And how many from TCA in total? Two. Because in this case, we're talking about a glucose, and it turns the cycle twice. So we would have two from each for a total of four, which starts to make us think that, in fact, substrate level phosphorylation is not the shiznis. There's been very little ATP net from substrate level phosphorylation at the end of the TCA cycle. And in fact, it's the ETC and the PMF that really are pay dirt. 
that's when we really start to see that massive currency exchange getting a lot of ATPs for every NADH that's been made. So that's where we need to turn our attention is to that, the ETC. So looking at our poster, how are they coming? Hopefully they're starting to look really good. So this is kind of my, this is my lame poster. I mean, this is really lame compared to what yours is going to look like, right? It's going to have all the transporters on it, all the material from the whole time all over it. Um, but in any case, I have glycolysis on it, and, and I'm reminding us that we net two ATPs from that pathway, right? One gets put in, one gets put in, minus two, depressing, but then two come out, we're at zero, and finally we're netting two down here. I'm reminding us of the transition step and the turns of the TCA where one, two, three NADH per turn, one ATPs per turn, one magnificent FADH2 in the heart of the superhero enzyme. So right there it is in red, the most beautiful enzyme ever, and AD hydrogenase, playing its role in both the ETC and in the TCA. And notice the rest of the complexes of the ETC complexes one, two, three, and four all span the inner mitochondrial membrane. If we are inside of what kind of organism? Eukaryotic. Ross, there's donuts somewhere here. Um, <laughs> he slipped in. He's like, I know she's got donuts today. Um, <laughs> so eukaryotic, we're inside of the mitochondrion, and we're looking at the inner mitochondrial membrane where we find these amazing complexes of the ETC. Now, one thing to take note of is that NADH is going to drop its electrons off at complex one. So NADH will drop its electrons off at complex one, regenerating NAD+, and NAD+, can come back. Remember, it's a pizza delivery guy. It can come back, pick up more electrons, drop off more electrons, pick up more electrons, drop off more electrons, and that just keeps on cycling. So also recognize that the FADH2 cycles inside of this enzyme generating QH2. Now, QH2, Q, Q is flitting around in the phospholipid tails of this inner mitochondrial membrane. So we're gonna need to zoom in closer before we can see QH2 very well, right? So let's go ahead and, and look first at the energetics of the ETC. And then we'll look at the physical state of it. So notice that we have two separate axes labeled on this picture. On the left is the standard reduction potential, a.k.a. the desire for electrons in a complete electron transfer, the E0 prime. Now remember that NADH has relatively little desire for its electrons. The first member of the ETC is far more desiring of those electrons, or said another way, the first complex of the ETC is what, a stronger or weaker oxidizing agent? <coughs> this is a hard question. Right? If something's a strong oxidizing agent, it means it's ripping electrons, right? So it's the first complex of the ET stronger, ETC stronger or weaker than NADH? Stronger, right? More desiring of those electrons. We can also say it has a higher standard reduction potential. So NADH very willingly gives its electrons to the first complex of the ETC. We can call it complex one. We could also think about it with, return, with, um, with terms of, a be, of being a dehydrogenase, right? NADH dehydrogenase is its name. So NADH gives up those electrons. It's like, here, dude, have the pizza. And complex one takes those on and feels pretty happy about that. Complex one becomes reduced. And now, as it turns out, complex one has lots of centers in it that pass the electrons along from one member to the next to the next that has increasingly high standard reduction potential until finally it passes its electrons to that flitty Q that's hanging out in the phospholipid tails. So from complex one, electrons go to Q. But that's cool because it turns out that Q is sort of the universal carrier from both complex one and complex two. So ubiquinone is a multitasker. 
it picks up electrons from either complex one or complex two. We know that FADH2 is getting made inside of complex two, the Wonder Woman enzyme, also known as succinate dehydrogenase, you got it. So the Wonder Woman enzyme will be the location in which FADH2 is reduced, but of course FADH2 doesn't leave that enzyme, and instead it just, it just passes its electrons right onto Q. So whether Q gets electrons from complex one or from complex two, it becomes QH2, it becomes reduced, and it can carry those electrons to complex three. Now I like to think of this sort of as being like a highway, that um, you have multiple viaducts like onto the highway. So QH2 can get made from either complex one or complex two. Okay? Either the electrons can come from one route or from another, but they both go on to Q. So all roads have met at Q. Now QH2 goes off to complex three. It drops its electrons off at complex three. There are a lot of centers again in complex three. It passes electrons throughout its centers, and then it gives them to cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is a peripheral membrane protein. It flits along the outer leaflet of the outer or of the inner membrane of the mitochondria, and it takes its electrons to complex four. Now, let's make sure we're understanding the flow here. Does complex four have a higher or lower standard reduction potential than complex three? Higher, right? Said another way, we could say complex four is a stronger or weaker oxidizing agent. Stronger, right, good. So complex four gets reduced, and there are a lot of centers inside of complex four, but the last center is a place where oxygen binds. And O2's like, woohoo, look at me, I am the best terminal electron acceptor. Send the electrons to me last. And it gets the electrons very last, and when oxygen gets reduced, it forms the last product of respiration. We've seen all the CO2s pop off, right? They popped off in the transition step. They popped off in the TCA cycle. So CO2 has been lost, and now the last product of aerobic respiration, H2O, is lost in the last step in which O2 is reduced. So we have to remember that as these electrons are flowing downstream, right, they really are flowing downstream from something with a lower standard reduction potential to something with a higher standard reduction potential, a lot of energy is getting released. What form is that energy going to take? Proton motive force. Good. Good. You guys are on today. See, it's the donuts. I should bring donuts every day. So we see that the PMF is generated. And these are the members that do it. Complex one pumps protons, complex three pumps protons, complex four pumps protons. I mean, give Wonder Woman a break, right? She's already doing a lot. She doesn't pump any protons. So complex two is not a proton pumping member. It's busy doing its work in the TCA. So complex one, three, and four are going to pump the protons. Now, let's look at a physical depiction of this as soon as we write down that energy is released as electrons are transferred. And you can even write a note to yourself, energy is released and it is pent up into the PMF, right? It becomes the force behind the PMF. I have a lot of cool models, but this is one of my very favorites. In fact, I sent it home with somebody last semester to get fixed because it's a little, it was getting a little worn. Um, this is the physical depiction of the electron transport chain of the mitochondrion. And you can see complex one, two, three, four. And what's this big really guy? ATP synthase, right? The most awesome factory of ATP ever. Um, this is what lets the protons go back in. It turns a kind of turbine, proton-powered turbine, ATP inside of the mitochondrial matrix. I'm going to pass this around so as we're looking at the picture, you can also be looking at the model. One of the coolest things about this model is that it actually shows like NADH getting oxidized to form NAD+. And then NAD+, of course, goes back to its, its enzyme. Very neat model. I love it. Oh, it's See, is that not beautiful or what? Um, just a good looking model. So, um, standard reduction potential, yeah, increases. So, essentially, what you could say is throughout the chain, um, 
molecules are being, well, so the intermediates are being oxidized extensively throughout, releasing, uh, releasing energy. So there's more things throughout the chain have a higher and higher standard reduction potential are stronger and strong, stronger oxidizing agents. Right. Sweet. And notice that that's releasing energy, right? It's releasing free energy in that process. Good. So here's what it looks like. Um, one thing to note, this is a little hard sometimes to see. It's hard for me to show that Q, so we're showing Q as this little purple guy. Q does not go through complex two. Q is a lipid soluble molecule. It flits around in the phospholipid tails. It does not go in any way through complex two. I'm just trying to show, if we could do it in three dimensions, we might show complex one over here and complex two over here, and then the electron viaduct onto Q like that. Because it's not that Q, it's, it's that QH2 can be generated from either complex one or complex two, okay? So NADH delivers its electrons to complex one. It passes its two electrons. Remember, it carries a hydride anion. So it passes its two electrons on to complex one, also known fittingly as NADH dehydrogenase. And this forms NAD+, because it's in type. NAD+, heads on back to the original, you know, some, some enzyme, right, that needs its cofactor. And now the electrons are firmly bound inside a complex one. Within complex one, they are transferred, and the release of energy is used to pump protons. So four po protons um, are estimated to be pumped by this machine. From complex one, the electrons go on to Q, making QH2, or said another way, ubiquinone becomes ubiquinol when it takes on the two electrons. Ubiquinone is the oxidized form, ubiquinol is the reduced form. Or just remember that Q becomes QH2, and it now carries the high energy electrons. Now they get transferred to complex three. Complex three also has several electron centers. In fact, it's quite a complicated complex. There's um, a lot of different subunits in this, it's a huge membrane-spanning integral membrane protein with a lot of different subunits, a lot of polypeptide chain, all devoted to electron transfer. And when it transfers electrons, it also pumps protons. So complex three also pumps protons. Now, I want to follow these two electrons that are coming from NADH and I don't want to think right now about the energy coming from FADH2. I do want to make note that this is the Wonder Woman enzyme, and this is the site where succinate is getting oxidized. So if you should be so inclined, you might draw step six of the TCA cycle happening right here where we see succinate getting oxidized to fumarate, and you could just make note to yourself, right, that the TCA is turning in there, and that's the site of oxidation of succinate. But, so, really quickly before we leave that behind, what does that automatically mean about the electrons that come from step six of the TCA cycle, or said another way, the electrons that come from FADH2? Are they going to be worth more or less energy than the electrons that come from NADH? Less, because they're entering later. They don't have the chance to pump any protons in complex one, and complex two is not a proton pumper. So you could say that those electrons don't pump any protons until they get to complex three. Keep that in mind. But now, hey, so far, how many electrons or how many protons? have been pumped from the two electrons that came from the NADH? Four. So far, four here. Oh, wait. But then what about this? 
eight, right? So once we've gotten to the end of complex three and the electrons are transferred onto cytochrome C, eight protons have been pumped from just two electrons coming off of NADH. Now, we're yet to hit complex four, the binding site of oxygen, also known as cytochrome C oxidase. So this is a very famous enzyme. We're going to see more of it. And it, too, is going to pump protons, only two, though. And, of course, this is the site where oxygen binds, and we make H2O. End of the story. End of the journey for these electrons that have been so long being stripped and ripped. And now you're about hitting that donut low, I'm guessing, you know, right around now. And you're just breathing out a lot of CO2 and water. <sighs> All right. You know, <laughs> so give me another donut. Somebody else wants the donut. Um, so we recognize that as being that um, process, okay? So now all of those um, protons can swoosh in to ATP synthase, turning the turbine. And that turbine turns and allows ATP to get made. So literally, there is this force pent up. The PMF is this force pent up, allowing ATP to be synthesized, OK? So this is something called the chemiosmotic hypothesis. And it wasn't until the 60s, the 1960s, that a man named Peter Mitchell came up with this. And still people thought he was kind of crazy. You're like, really? A proton motor force actually makes ATP? No way, dude. There's got to be some high energy donor of the phosphoryl group, right? Something like what we see in glycolysis or TCA. But no, there wasn't. It was all just the PMF. So before you come next time, you have a little homework here. I want you to write down some conversion factors. One, how many protons in total are pumped per NADH? How many protons in total are pumped per FADH2? How many ATPs are made per NADH? And how many ATPs are made per FADH2? So chemiosmotic hypothesis, protons are worth power, right? They make ATP. Have a fabulous day. I will see you tomorrow.